It's such a pleasure to have you here and uh, to see this film. Uh, I, I've seen it before, of course, but to see it again, I was so moved. I was a little afraid of how I was going to conduct the, the interview. And when I, when you have kind of when you remove the fact that you don't have to follow the story that much, you can see the, the preciseness, the exactness, and there is no wonder that you won the best script in Cannes. This is this is a perfect script in my opinion. So I want to begin by thanking you for a marvelous, very touching film. Um, and um, you you always write your own films. Uh, you also write for other directors. We'll, we'll get back to that. Uh, but what, what was the original idea for this film? Well, there was the the desire to to dedicate the film to a love story. Um, to write a film about love, how love is, is, is born, to first, you know, to watch carefully, patiently, to the silver, uh, to watch the film Desire, also, um, to depart from this convention that love is in another a romantic comedy uh, or drama convention, that the two people looking very good, being in an elevator, and we would be for them to be in love. Uh, from, from into in flights in yeah. levels. So uh, it was the opposite. It was about how yeah how love of desire and how love grows and flourishes. Um, I think to look very carefully at that and also to have this other layer of the um, uh, also the memory uh, of the love, the print of the love story, what's said of the love story, the di dynamic of love, uh, philosophy, politics as well. So that was the first um, spark. Um, uh, also wanted to to depart from my like, first film that I kind of consider as a trilogy because they were all kind of rich stories. They were all also be non professional actresses. And uh, this time I wanted to work with yeah, to tell the story of Gunga, uh with being professional actress and also wanted to work with the dead again. Mm -hmm. um, Which you did in what the is back in two thousand and seven. Seven. Yeah, exactly. Well, and there. now Thirty roles and two exercises later you get to work again. Yeah. That must be a big a big thing, kind of thing that from the scene and being part of the the first big role. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, it was it was part of the of the whole project and it's um uh, it's a movie uh, I had of course I had in mind right in the film. Um, and we try to create yeah, this thing that we collaborate. Um, and I wrote a very disciplined credit. Is that what you said? Yeah, but when I write, it's a very, it's a very lonely process. It's that always the process, sorry. Yes, yeah. nobody reads uh, the scripts except my producer, but when it's actually, like, when it's a very special accomplished. Um, so it's been a long, long process of. Uh, of, of thinking about it, first really buffering uh, for two and a half years, um, finding, trying to find yeah, this new form. Um, and, yeah. yeah. So, uh, why did you decide the, for this setting, placing it in the 18th century? Well, I want to talk about human art. All the other things have been in, in modern art yeah. today. Exactly. Um, I, I know, I mean, I have no particular passion for the, the, the costume drama or the piece that we're going for here. Um, but, um, so it wasn't about that, it wasn't about that specific genre. It was um, really about the fact that I wanted to talk about a you know, woman artist and show a woman at work, and really wanted to show it. So, uh, you know, writing, when you show writer and cinematic, this is not cinematic at all. And it's, you know, it's like the elevator in the romantic comedy. Um, I wanted to show them that like, we're going to talk about cinema, of course, and, 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 um, and to, to, to tell about the relationship, the, the creative relationship between the mother and you know, an artist. So I wanted to, to I went for painting. Um, and when we threw out art history um, from the perspective of women, that was a short book to read, because uh, it's not even written. Um, and, um, and give up. Um, had, uh, discovered, not discovered, um, uh, but learned um, about this particular moment in art history. I was totally ignorant of that. There is the second half of the 18th century where uh, women artists were very, there were many women artists in France, in Europe, 
uh, hundreds of them actually living and flourishing for years um, in the young days, uh, is a concept. Um, I told you about the ZX it's now. The male gaze is a concept um, invented by Laura Harvey in 1975 um, that, that said that cinema, basically, a lot of cinema relies on the fact that of the, of the pleasure of objectifying women, and that pleasure is shared with the director's perspective and the people's perspective. Um, so women are, are objects, are not subject, we don't share their experience. And a, a lot of cinema has been big, I mean, cinema is invented. Uh, is invented around the male gaze. So, uh, the female gaze would be, uh, uh, well, not the opposite. I mean, because male gaze is the convention, I mean, the female gaze will be departing from convention. Uh, so maybe it's a, it's a gaze that is free, you know. When we talk about female gaze, it seems like this would be this feminine look on things, uh, like how, it's not about how we look at trees, uh, it's how we look at people, it's how we look at stories, it's also how we share our experiences. Um, and it's definitely hybrid because you have to deconstruct the male gaze because we were all raised, uh, it's like when you're a lesbian, you have to deconstruct, you've been raised by heterosexuals, you have to deconstruct it, you know. Um, so, um, female, female gaze in, in the film, well, the film is basically, uh, the plot of the film is the gaze, and some critics have said that, you know, we could talk about portrait as a female gaze the movie. Which is not something very good in the marketing <laughs> wise, I think. <laughs> um, but I, I didn't plan it that way. It's not a manifesto for female case, it, but it is a manifesto because I think every film should be a manifesto for itself. Um, so the film is being really, really playful with this idea because the case is the plot. So uh, it's actually an evolution of the case uh, within the film. So at first, it's this woman who's the first, the first line of the film is take the time to look at me, um, and and then it's about the gazing at another one with with one of them not actually knowing what this gaze is. Then the gaze is coming, is coming neutral. Then it's actually about her being the, the, the painter feeling the fact that she's also looked at. It's so it's, it's about harvesting uh, this tension of looking uh, at each other. Um, and sharing the experience of both the character. Um, and we also have this painter model situation where usually we call up people that uh, an artist and muse situation. Um, and we wanted to, to show it differently. Um, that is, that the muse is usually uh, this fetishized silent woman who is totally objectifies and she's just inspiring because she's beautiful and she's in the room. Um, we are not working like that, and I think it's not even true uh, in a historical way. Um, women they have not been given the opportunity to be artists, some of them are still managed, but the opportunity they were given to be in the workshop um, was as models, and they seized that opportunity that they were when they were in the room, and they were definitely uh, yeah, part of the process of creation. This is a story that is, is I mean, we, we tell that story, but we're not the only one. It's more process of all cultural moment um, of the reappropriation of, uh, of the woman participation in the story of art, which is great, you know, even if you look at the cave, at the cave persons, and you know the cave where they were in the tree story of time, I want to say cave man, because, you know, it's, uh, so cave person, um, you know, they used to sign their you know, drawing with their hands, and if you look at the size of their hands, well, actually, they're quite small, so they might be teenagers or women. Mm -hmm. So I want to go back to the middle. Uh, how did you first decide to become a film director? When did it happen? Well, I didn't actually decide it. I mean, uh, basically, um, I knew that I wanted. I mean, I've, I've been. Uh, I decided to be a cinephile. Um, that is to say, go by myself to the cinema, choosing what film I wanted to see. Because I had the, the, the luck, also the opportunity. There was a, a, a half house theater in the town of um, And when I was 13, uh, I decided I would spend my time there. So I went to the cinema three, four times a week. Um, they had a great programmation, so I was just going to see everything. Um, and I didn't decide to be a director, but I decided to put cinema at the center of my life, which means first going to the cinema. Then dreaming about what can I do, and, and I'm, you know, as a woman, as a woman, as a teenager, I was like, I must be an actress if, if I want to be part of this world. 
and so I'm like, I really want to do that. And, and, and so it's like I want to maybe should be a critic because you know I could, I could write about films. Um, and then decided not to decide. And just to say that I I studied literature. Um, I, I I loved school, uh, so I just decided that if I studied things that I love, I would end up doing something not too far away from some, from my passions. Um, and at some point, I saw that yeah, I, I did all my studies in literature, didn't study cinema, decided to take a job um, working marketing. Um, Timothy is the movie, <laughs> and uh, and quit my job. Uh, you know, it gave me autonomy, me, you know, and I stopped living in Paris, and, and then decided to quit my job and and, and enter. I mean, try to enter a national film school um, as a screenwriter. So it's a desire to be a director, uh, yes. So then it was uh, this four years of, of studying and writing my first original script there, which was what it is. And then when I got out, I got a lot of attention with the script. And you know, in France, we have this strong tradition where you write, but you direct. There's no that the script without the director. Mm. It's the author tradition. It's the other tradition. So, which is a good tradition because you can help so people like me to actually don't feel legitimate to actually you know, take, the, take, the, take the leap. Um, and I met my producer. Um, that you've been working with since. Yeah, we did our four films together. Um, and she, she said, you're a director, uh, you're a director, you should cover it, and, and there we go. Mm. And, and Waterville is, is uh, about uh, 300 girls, and it's set in the water ballet world. Uh, and I think there's something really interesting about that sport, about the performativity of that sport. Why did you choose that as well? Yeah. Well, precisely for what you think. Um, okay, we need to talk about this. No. <laughs> and then... I, it's, it's, going, it's, so, it's not awkward yet. Um, yeah, I was totally um, attracted by how cinematic that sport was and, and how also it was uh, it told a lot about um, what was expected from women or teenagers because it's, you know, it's the only sport that is only exclusively female. Um, and so it's, it does a lot about femininity. Um, it's the, so it's the only sport where you should hide the fact that you're an athlete, the fact that it's painful, the fact that it's you know powerful because it is this um, this what's underneath the water in, in the films. Uh, you saw that uh, they're just really struggling to stay at the surface, and then at the surface they're all this. They're very. They do wear makeup and they perform. Um, it's like they are dolls and they smile. And they shoot. There is no pain in what they do, so that was like quite a metaphor. Um, and uh, also, it was uh, actually a personal anecdote uh, because I, I went to see a synchronized swimming uh, show um, when I was um, a teenager, and actually thought, I think I want to do this. I think this is like I was super moved, uh, but this is. And, and you know, it wasn't uh, Vivaldi, uh, the word didn't seem to Vivaldi, they didn't seem to cut an eye Joe. That's very responsive. Oh, yeah. because nobody knows, so you know. Yeah, you know about music here. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm cool, because I don't, and, uh, otherwise I'd have to, to sing it. Please don't. So there was nothing, you know, there was nothing really like, uh, this, there was not, nothing really. Uh, I mean, it can be really seen as something like ridiculous, yeah. and, uh, and, and I felt I thought it was really sublime, and, and didn't understand why. And I was using up my own desire. I think I just wanted to be as accomplished, as athletic, and also as part of a, of a team uh, as this as this girl. Also, you know, just was actually falling in love with all, all of them. Um, and I thought, well, this is a good. Uh, this is awkward. So this is a good plot for a film about the rise of desire. I'm just thinking there must have been something. Okay, so you shouldn't make films with animals and children, and I guess you shouldn't make films with a lot of children in pools. So what were the challenges in this film? I can only imagine. Electricity. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Well, it's a very cinematic set. I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, I don't think that, it wasn't really, the challenge was here, actually, okay. yeah. Um, and the or, I don't remember. Um, I, sh I shot the film in my hometown, and in the pool, where I learned badly that she screamed. Uh, so, um, so really, no, I had no, I had no trouble with the pool. Let's move on to children. <laughs> and, and the next film you did, uh, Tomboys, uh, about um, a young girl, I guess she's maybe 11 or, or something. She's 10. Yeah. 10 mm -hmm. uh, who moves to a new town and uh, introduces herself as a boy to the, the children in the neighborhood. Um, and that's also for the form to do this somehow. And, what did you want to explore by, by making a movie about that? Well, um, I wanted to make a film about childhood and, and how, uh, without nostalgia, without a, without a retrospective look uh, on things, but really being at the height of children. And it's just I mean, it's here, I mean, yeah, the camera is here, but I think, you know, um, childhood is also a performance, childhood is also a moment where you is a, is a, is a moment of great violence and, and desires, and, and really wanted to, to, to look at that. Um, and to talk also about gender fluidity at that time. You know, it's, it's, it's the moment where there's still equality, and then, you know, you buy uh, that, that, that frontier, um, and then you don't have, have to be uh, you know. um, Also, it was um, a lot of the, the, the desires around my my films, the sparks, are also have to do with production. I also really wanted to make a second film that would be lighter, uh, even regarding the production, cheaper, um, and to make it like a pirate. So it's a film that I wrote in two weeks oh. and shot in 20 days, okay. uh, like two months later, uh, finding a little bit of money, uh, actually financing it uh, retrospectively. And with this idea that can you, yeah, can you decide that you're going to make a film three months later? You know, cinema is such, has so much money, it's so much weight. Um, and I thought, well, if I get to do a film about childhood, I'm going to do it that way, because it's a big game. So it was really impulsive, um, and, and it's not at all the same process as the first film, or this one. Um, and, um, and, and it was also working with very, very young children. Uh, because she, she's 10, but this is little sister was five, and, and um, really trying to, yeah, to make it really fast and, and not think too much about it. Uh, it's only 50 scenes, um, it's an hour and 20 minutes, and it's, it's uh, I really thought about the film as an arrow uh, that would like go really fast into your heart. Mm -hmm. Which you definitely did. And the next one you did uh, is Bird that you won the bronze horse for, uh, where we are following four young girls uh, in the suburbs of, of Paris. And uh, I, I really feel that there's such authenticity in the film. I've been there, I don't know, but you really feel like, okay, this person knows what she's talking about. Uh, how did the film come about? Did you do some kind of research? I was thinking about the Norwegian uh, series Scum, that you already had a French version of, and there was such a massive research before that I actually started writing. Uh, how did it appear? Well, no, it was mostly about... Um, <laughs> I really wanted to, to look at youth as in its mythological way, and actually to, to bring those characters that are rarely seen on screen um, as equals. As the other characters, so you know, but, uh, not be uh, not not treat them differently, um, and, and but this time to talk, I really wanted to talk about the group and how friendship um, is an emancipation. To further, uh, it was a film around sorority, um, and um, how also anger is legitimate, and and, and violence is a response to violence, and so it's it's it was more and more. Well, Weird film, also in a way that was cut in five episodes. I thought a lot about uh, you know TV series and, and found okay, this is five uh, five times twenty five minutes, and really wanted to show this, yeah this character in a very mythological way. That is she she goes through all the identities 
that society uh, proposes to her. And so each time it's like this 20 minutes of embodying one of the possibility. Um, and, um, and it's also the first time that it's a film about a group. That's also why it was shot in Cinemascope. It's my own film in Cinemascope. I, I, I think I'm a more uh, 185 person, but really wanted to put four people in the frame. Um, and um, I don't know, it's a messy answer, but... Uh, <laughs> no, I think I made it very clear. Um, you also, as I mentioned, you also write, and you're an educated screenwriter for, for other people, so uh, what is different between the projects that you intend to direct yourself and the projects that you're writing for someone else in, in the process of writing? Well, it depends on the director. I've been, I mean, the two, I've been writing also for films that haven't been made. So I won't talk about those ones. Um, but so the two films that are that have been made are, are My Life is a Tukini, or is it Courgette here? I don't know. Tukini? Yeah. And there's also the André Tichini film at being 17. So it's two a very different way because you, you you can either work with Tishine, for instance, I work I go I go to this place every day and I work and, and decide everything together and then I would I would go back and, and, uh, and actually write the script but it's really really an everyday collaboration. collaboration. Um, whereas on my life as a Tukini, the process was already it's animation, so it took like um, like a hundred years to do it, so it's stop motion. Um, and there was already like, a, a, a version of the script, there was already a little teaser, the character design was there. So it was different. I, 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 uh, I wrote the script by myself uh, on the basis of what Claude Palas had been working for a, a, lot, a lot of years. So it was a very strong material, there was also a book. Um, and also there were these characters, I mean, they were, they were, they were, draw, they were drawings. But I was, I felt I was writing for the guinea, I was writing for this character, mm. um, which felt really, really different. Um, whereas for writing for Henri Tichini was this very legitimate character and that, that I was slowly a fan of his work when I was uh, 14, 13, 15. Um, it was about, um, it's always about why, why do they call you? They call you for something they know you can do. So we wanted to, to, to do a film about two teenagers. Um, and, uh, and to make it very physical, because I'm writing in a very behaviorist way, you know, it's not about sad, it's not about like, psychology of the characters, they don't exist. You know? That's what they do. Um, and uh, so in a way, you, you, yeah, you have your signature, and that's why they're coming for you, mm -hmm. but it's all about having an ambition mm -hmm. for the character. You know, often I'm asked, like, do, is it difficult to let the script go? And I'm like, no, oh. it's like, oh, go! I'm not writing it for myself, I'm just, I'm never frustrated, I don't, I don't want to do it. Because I this, yeah, but I have this ambition for him. And for instance, with Henri Tichiné, I had, I had the ambition of, of looking at, at him like he was a first-time director. So that's my secret, I'm not telling you. Um, and uh, so it's, yeah, it's different each time. But you know, it's a job that um, I don't know if I will uh, still do, actually, because of the, the, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful to write for somebody. It's really, really, it's good for ego also. Uh, and, but um, it's because you're, you're definitely, you know, at the center of attention, you can, and also sometimes it makes you more free to experiment things. And I like a lot that position, but it's also taking a lot, a lot of time. Like for instance, it's five years between film and portrait. And it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of reason for that. But one of them is also that writing for others, you know, sometimes put, a good delay, and sometimes uh, it's, it's, it cuts you away from mm. your own um, art. You know, uh, I was going to open up for the audience if there's someone who has a question, but I, I have one uh, last question, which is about uh, in your films, in, in uh, order it is, there are no parents. Uh, in this film, there are no men. In, in girlhood, there's no well, there is one scene when she goes into town, so the works, but otherwise it's this. There are these closed spaces that you 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 are describing. What is it about the closed space that fascinates you? 
It's not about digital space, um, actually. It's about uh, sharing the experience of the character. And each character, each time. I mean, um, if you want to share the experience of a teenage, a teenage girl, um, you, you, if you put the parents, then you put the tension of some kind of oppression or older or, and it's, uh, so it's about the conflict. It's about what you, what can you do, what can you not. It's about, and I was trying to be, to get rid of those old conflicts that you know, you know uh, when we were talking about the female, because I think that's something that the female can do. You know, it's not, about, it's not only like how do you not objectify women, because this is very easy. You don't have to scratch your head for three hours. <laughs> How are you not going to find women? It's easy, yeah, really. Um, uh, but um, you have to want it. You, you just have to choose it. You say, I'm not going to do it. And that is happening. Uh, it's, it's, also, it's still a nice world that we're going to put the camera on. That's, that's the answer you have to do. Yeah, and, and, and so, um, but but uh, I got lost. Sorry. It's about also new narratives. So, for instance, in the portrait, there is no man because we are looking at the frame is the oppression, and what we leave out of the frame is the oppression. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to talk about the want to put the man in the frame, and, and so that it will be an, the enemy, the person that would be between them, because this is something that we've seen and seen, um, and, and and also I don't want to objectify men, so I'm not putting them in that position. <laughs> um, and in, in one of these teenage girls, it's the same. You want to share the experience of a teenage girl, you have to share their loneliness. Mm. You want to share what it's like to be a kid, you have to share their loneliness. Otherwise, you're just sharing, you're just showing the same narrative of you know, conflict, uh, portraits, easily that case, because it is um, mm. driven, yeah, but mostly equality driven. Mm. It's a love story with equality. There is no gender domination, there is no intellectual domination, there is no, we're not playing with social hierarchy, for instance. So it's about, yeah, cinema is the only art where you can share somebody's loneliness. Um, because even literature is a voice. Mm. It's a, maybe, maybe even if it's a stream of consciousness, you know, sometimes it is. You know, maybe, and maybe Virginia Woolf is, is, uh, is sharing loneliness, for instance. But it's pretty rare. Uh, cinema is quite, it's, you just, it's quite easy uh, to share somebody's loneliness. Just put somebody in the room, and if you share the loneliness, then uh, you share, it is, especially with the character, you can start to share the experience. Mm -hmm. So, I want to see if there's someone who has a question, maybe we can get some light uh, in the audience. Yes, uh, uh, in Girlhood there's a, a musical moment where, the, where the, character, the main characters dance in a hotel room to Rihanna's Diamonds. And in this, in this movie there's a musical moment where all the women uh, at the party, yeah, I guess, you start singing. But where did that moment come from? What, what, what is the song? Was it written for the film, or is it an old song? Or... It's a weird version of Cotton Eye Joe, actually. <laughs> 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 We're going to sing it eventually. Um, so, yeah, it's a song that is uh, composed for the film. Um, as you, as you notice, there's no music in the film, and um, and it, it's which felt kind of scary at the beginning because a love story without a, without without a score. Yeah, without the boy. Yeah, yeah, but it's it's, it's um, that's part of the pleasure. So the love story, you can always play the game. You're like Titanic, I have to go on. Uh, love story, love story. Um, and um, but it was really really a matter of reconstitution because you know the film is also about uh, the. the um, the importance of art in our life, the relationship to art, and, and it's 18th century. And, 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 and so, you know, finding a book is important, listening to music, you have to go to church, which explains a lot of success of religion. Religion, of course, we know that God owes a lot to back, um, back the composer. Um, um, so it was putting you in the same position as equal, uh, as the, um, so that when music occurs, it's, it has to be really, really important. I, mean, I also make the link between the girlhood Rihanna moments and this bonfire scene because it's actually even I see now the, the Rihanna scene as a kind of a sketch for portrait of the young fire because it's kind of the same position. Uh, the, the, the Rihanna moment is one of the rare uh, shot counter shots that I did. Because portrait is a lot about shot counter shot, but reverse shot. 
But um, it was very few. Uh, there were very few in, in my previous films. And 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 girl boots. She's actually looking um, at her friends. And at some point, she enters her own gaze to join the group. Um, and I, I tried to think of those musical moments uh, as in um, musicals, actually. Uh, that was the first film that my, uh, as a young cinephile, that was found out. It was really, my grandmother showed me all the musical French stairs, and, uh, mostly. Um, so that my culture, and in a musical, when they start to sing, usually it's because something really, really important is happening. It's going to be the first kiss. Uh, um, so I'm always trying to think of the musical moments in my film as a uh, climatic, a dramatic moment for the character when you know, it or something. Um, so, sorry, I'm talking about uh, Okay, no, it's, it's interesting. Um, and so, um, in any portrait, as I knew that it would only be Divaldi because I wanted a hit for classical music, because I wanted it to be really, really democratic. Some people told me, why didn't you be true to play the practical? <laughs> because, because I don't know it. It's, it's, it should be, you know, it should be really, really democratic moment. Um, uh, but also the pleasure of cinema is is uh, is when you can get to invent music. That's that's I think that's the thing that moves me the most as a director. It's not the thing that I craft myself, craft myself. Um, it's the thing that somebody does for you, and so the actors. Like you, you will love that. Um, but music, it's like suddenly somebody, there's another author designing something. We did this for some years we It's Power One, and uh, we did the music for all my films. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, with a uh, uh, more classical guy this time, uh, named Arthur Simoni. Mm -hmm. and, um, and you can hear it on Spotify. <laughs> okay. mm -hmm. So, yeah, the, the mic has passed back. Um, hello yes. and thank you for. Uh, <laughs> Who are you? I'm okay. here. There's a hand. There. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you for a beautiful film and um, and of course about the entering because um, when did you know that you wanted to end this film this way? Because there's a, a discussion I think especially within the LGBT films that they're often have an unhappy ending. Someone should probably die and like that. And in this film they. Well, no one dies, but they don't adapt together. But I still leave this film feeling happy, and I, I think it was an amazing achievement. But I just want to know when did you know that you wanted to end the film in this way? From the start. That's the first scene that I had in mind for this film. I built the film to do that scene. You know, and it was a difficult writing process of this film, really long, um, with a lot of questions. And at some point, I give up, and, and it's that scene. And I was like, I have to do that scene. This is like, I, there was the compass. I knew that that, that that was what I wanted to say, and that I had to do this this shot, this scene. So, yeah, it's the first time actually that at the ending, and that it all, I mean, it's not, not a lie, it's not a lie to you, but I had this very strong vision. Um, and actually, yes, I, I think it's a positive ending. Uh, lesbian has been really, really <gasps> poor, the poor lesbians in cinema. <laughs> <laughs> they die, or they go through suicide, or they get killed, one of them anyway. Once I'm much into this, so she gets married, so she's safe. <laughs> so we've been suffering a lot. And, um, <laughs> but um, to me, this is a happy end because, you know, that's the narrative. Uh, it's not about this the happy end in cinema, in a love story. I'm never really happy when the two people that get married, there's this frozen image. It's just something that you did in the room. It doesn't tell you about love. It doesn't tell you much about love. Um, the fact that there are no, that their love is a future because their love is a dynamic. Their love made them, made them more um, brave, made them more alive, uh, more open um, to me is uh, the, the politics of love we want to talk about, and that's also a lesbian narrative, uh, a lesbian imaginary. Uh, um, so uh, that's why to me it's, a, it's a, also a happy ending. But it's also an ending that talks about cinema. You know, It's not only the, 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 the climax of the relationship between the characters or the, the meaning of the relationship between the characters, because it's a long thing, as you 
notice that it's too extreme in its own. Um, and in the process, at first, it's about this dynamic of the short reverse shot when somebody watches somebody that doesn't know. But within the first, I mean, after 30 seconds, you don't think about uh, Maya looking at Louise. You are actually looking at Adele and Elle, an actress performing. You are in a theater seat, she's in a theater seat. The shot, the reverse shot, is about you and her. And it's about a cinema unveiling itself. And, and, and leaving space for you, for your own <coughs> stories, uh, for your own love, or lost love, or future love. Um, there's a... Oh! <laughs> 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 okay. No, but there's a, there's a poet um, uh, named Mary Oliver, she's an American poet, that's, she, she passed away in January. And she has this poem that sums, that sums the film, that sums this idea, this scene. She says, a broken heart is an open heart to the rest of the world. And, um, that's it. Can you <laughs> Thank you so much for this talk. I've been uh, looking forward to it, but you managed to deliver even more than I agreed. <laughs> so thank you so much. And now we go over to the to the next part, which is presenting you with the award. And I think we can remain seated while I uh, ask the festival director Git Changers to come on stage. Well, thank you.